Perfect. Okay. Well, everyone, welcome back to a very exciting episode of the Story Box podcast. Today, my friends, I'm delighted to work on one of my all-time favorite doctors who has helped me overcome a tremendous amount of gut problems in my life, mostly contributed to myself <laughs> with regards to the gut problems. Many of you would know who he is. His name is Dr. Stephen Gundry, Dr. G, many people call him. But Dr. Gundry is one of the world's top cardiothoracic surgeons and a pioneer in nutrition as well as uh, he's also a medical doctor. He still sees patients. I don't know how the guy does it. He's just like a force of nature. And he's the International Heart and Lung Institute Center for Restorative Medicine that he's also a part of. He has spent the last two decades studying the microbiome and now helps patients use diet and nutrition as a key form of treatment. He's got his very best-selling books, one up there, The Plant Paradox, which has helped me overcome SIBO, IBS, you name it. Uh, he's got a longevity paradox, he's got the energy paradox, and now I'm excited to tell you about his new book, which I've been scouring through the last couple of days and absolutely loving. It's called Unlocking the Keto Code, the revolutionary new science of keto that offers more benefits without deprivation. Dr. Gundry, can I welcome you back to the Storybox podcast today? It's great to be back on Storybox. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for making the time to be here again. And thank you for writing another book so we can talk. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Good to see you again, Jay. <laughs> always, always love being able to speak with you and unbox more of your wisdom and advice from my audience. Uh, the very first question that I have for you is why keto? Well, I, I wrote this book because uh, when I was doing The Energy Paradox, my last book, I was trying to explain the benefits of a ketogenic diet and what ketones do. And I've, I have a ketogenic version in all my books, including The Plant Paradox. So, And I was, I'm a big fan of what ketones supposedly do. But as I, in all my books, I try to put solid research and reference for, for whatever I say. And lo and behold, when I really started to say, okay, you know, here's the proof that this is how this works. This is what we all believe. It turns out that the actual research is about 180 degrees opposite of what is actually happening with ketones. And when, you know, when I saw that, I said, oh, my gosh, you know, I've, I've got to reexamine everything I've ever thought about ketones. And um, they are not the super fuel that everybody thinks they are. Mm -hmm. They are not a method to increase the efficiency of fat burning. In fact, they're exactly the opposite. And so if they don't do these things that all of us keto experts said, what do they do? And are they doing something that's really good? It turns out they do something that's really good. Um, that was the purpose of writing the book. For those people that don't know what ketones are and what their purpose is in the body, would you be able to explain a little bit more for people? Sure. Um, briefly, ketones were actually discovered uh, back in the 1800s, late 1800s, uh, as a uh, fat soluble, uh, water soluble fat molecule that when people were starving, um, these ketones appeared in the blood and also in the urine. Uh, subsequently, it was found that type 1 diabetics um, made a lot of ketones, and many people assume ketoacidosis, which is really bad for you, must be what ketones do, and that's actually not the case. The ketogenic diet was actually started in the 1930s as a treatment form for childhood epilepsy, and this was before any drugs were available. And lo and behold, uh, the reason it was started is that children with epilepsy who were starving because they were having so many epileptic fits, mm. the less they ate, the more their seizures went away. And they went, wow, what, you know, what's the deal with that? Well, you can't starve a kid. Uh, so they realized that it was the ketones that were suppressing the seizures. Mm -hmm. So at the Mayo Clinic, the, the ketogenic diet was coined at the Mayo Clinic to put people on an 80% fat diet, 10% carbohydrates, and 10% protein, kids. And that diet was remarkably effective. About 50% of kids had complete seizure control. And the diet was used until drugs like phenobarbital and dilantin uh, came along. And then it kind of fell off as, as a method. But 
people were intrigued with, okay, you know, how did ketones help the brain? Mm. It wasn't until uh, the 1970s, 80s, 90s, even 2000s, where researchers primarily at Harvard, George Cahill and Dr. Owens, and at the NIH, Dr. Veach, really got into what ketones were doing, particularly for the brain. Real briefly, most of us can, if we run out of sugar, uh, can start generating free fatty acids out of our fat cells. And those free fatty acids, fats, can be used by our mitochondria, the energy producing organelles, to generate ATP. And they can do it really well with that. The problem is that these free fatty acids are too big and bulky to get through the blood brain barrier into the brain. So that's a real problem. The brain loves glucose, but if glucose is run out, what do you do? Well, it just so happens that free fatty acids can go to the liver and be converted to ketones. And ketones are water soluble, small molecules, and lo and behold, they can get to the brain. So it's a um, survival mechanism when you run out of food. And believe it or not, we used to run out of food all the time. Uh, it could keep the brain going uh, until you, know, you had your next kill or found a patch of berries or whatever. Unfortunately, researchers said, well, ketones must be a great brain fuel because your brain keeps going. Well, again, work from Cahill and Owens and Veach actually found the exact opposite. Dr. Owens in 2004 showed that in human volunteers, ketones at full ketosis, the brain only uses 60 to 70% of its fuel as ketones. It still needs 30 to 40% fuel from glucose. So, so much for a super fuel. The full body, which is really shocking, at full ketosis, only 30% of the energy needs are met by using ketones. 70% are from free fatty acids. So you go, well, wait a minute, this isn't a super fuel. It's, it's a survival mechanism fuel, and it keeps the brain going in hard times. But what about its miraculous ability to help you burn fat, you know, like a keto giant, keto giant diet is supposed to do? What's fascinating is even I said, well, ketones make you an efficient fat burner and you're going to be burning up all your fat because you efficiently burn fat. Now there's a problem with that. And that is the definition of efficiency is to get more out of something, more energy, more mileage. And I use the example of, uh, of cars. If I want an efficient car, that is efficient at burning gas, and let's call gas fat, I'd get a Toyota Prius. I can go 50 miles on a gallon of gas. That's efficiency. But if I wanted to waste gas, if I wanted to be really inefficient in using gas, I'd buy a Ferrari. Now, there might be other reasons I'd want a Ferrari, but that's beside the point. So, a Ferrari is an incredibly inefficient way to use gasoline. What happens is we don't want to be a Toyota Prius if we're trying to lose weight. And the problem with a high-fat diet, fat has nine calories per gram versus four calories per gram of protein or carbohydrates. So if I'm an efficient fat burner and I'm eating a lot of fat, it's no wonder that a lot of people on a ketogenic diet actually gain weight. You know, I talk about those people in the book. So what ketones do, surprisingly, and this has, believe it or not, been known since 1978, is they actually tell mitochondria to literally waste a huge amount of calories that they might otherwise burn to produce ATP. Now, that seems in a way really stupid. Uh, and, I, and I go through all the reasons why this happens in the book. 
Simplistically, it's called mitochondrial uncoupling. And I, I'm sorry we have to use that term, but it's in the literature. And I spent six months trying to think of a better term. But in, in the end, my editor and I said, no, 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 this, this is what happens simplistically. A pressure cooker builds up pressure. And at some point, that pressure cooker is going to blow the lid off the pressure cooker. Uh, my mother did it when I was growing up. Um, stuff all over the ceiling. It was great fun. Uh, but the pressure cooker has a release valve, a pop-off valve, so that the, when the pressure gets too high, psh, the steam comes out. Mitochondria, it, making energy is really damaging to mitochondria. It's hard work. It's high pressure. It's hot and boiling and steaming in the mitochondria. So the mitochondria have pressure release valves. They actually have five of them and they're controlled by uncoupling proteins. And they're literally pressure release valves that say, hey, a lot of the stuff that we're using to make energy, ooh, it's too tough in here. Let's just release this stuff. And so we don't damage the mitochondria. And that's called mitochondrial uncoupling. The best way to look at it is if you take those calories and don't make it into energy, you basically throw them away. So it's a caloric bypass on your mitochondria. And what's fascinating is we, we now know that if you take uh, the super old people who are thriving and measure their amount of pop-off valves, how they're doing, they have the best functioning, highest pop-off valves of anybody. They're actually throwing away energy all the time. Mm. And I talk about this um, in the book. One of the, most of us think our genes are our destiny, right? And in fact, that's not true at all. But one of the most striking studies was in twins who carry the same genome. And there are sets of twins where one is thin and the other is fat. And you go, you know, what the heck? They have the same genes. So obviously it's not a fat gene that's doing this. So they've looked at mitochondria in these twins and the fat twins mitochondria are termed lazy. And that has nothing to do with the twin. They're not lazy, but their mitochondria really kind of turn most of everything you give them into fat. On the other hand, the thin twins are wasting energy. They're, they're running at high speed, but throwing literally calories away. And that explains why all of us um, have a skinny friend who eats literally anything they want. And they're, they're skinny. And then there's, you know, me and almost the rest of the world who work out and, you know, they're really, you know, we're really you know, working at this. And yet, you know, we eat a croissant and all of a sudden, <laughs> you know, there's a pound the next day. Wait, what the heck? You know, and, and it actually explains why these skinny people are the way they are because of this ability to waste fuel, not be efficient, just literally throw it away. Huh. Yeah. Who knew? Who knew that? <laughs> this is, uh, this is a lot for me to sort of unpack there for, for everyone. There's a lot of great, great information there, but it sounds like to me, cause we, we've, you said that we we've known this since 1970 something. Yeah. But what's, what's gone wrong? Like why have we been lied to for such a long time? If we've known it for like, yeah. <laughs> We, we haven't been lied to, but, and again, um, if, and I have a fun time uh, putting out uh, written statements in many of the keto experts books that are <laughs> absolutely categorically wrong. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, I, for instance, we know that when you're on a ketogenic diet or when you're starving, free fatty acids from fat cells can go to the liver 
and be converted into ketones. Now, what's interesting, uh, that, that go to the brain. What's interesting is the liver cannot use ketones. And if they could, you, they keep them for the cells, but the liver cannot use ketones as a fuel. So it's released. And one of my favorite is that you know, the ketones are the favorite fuel of the liver. Well, no, they're not. Um, th that's basic physiology. Uh, or that um, carbs are a dirty fuel and ketones are a clean fuel. No, there's absolutely no evidence of that. There's a famous quote that uh, three quarters of the world's population is carbohydrate intolerant. And it turns out the reference to that quote has nothing to do with carbohydrates. It has to do with a sugar in milk called lactose. And it's true, three quarters of the world are lactose intolerant, but that doesn't mean that they're carbohydrate intolerant. But people latch onto this and go, oh, no wonder we have to be on a ketogenic diet, a low carb diet. Three quarters of, of us can't eat carbohydrates. No wonder it works. It's not true at all. And one of the reasons I wrote this is once you know how ketones work to tell mitochondria to waste fuel, then you can look for all these other substances that, in, that actually act as if they're ketones that tell mitochondria to, to waste fuel. And in fact, the cool thing is a ton of these substances are in carbohydrate containing foods. So the reason I wrote the book is, well, look, in a way you can have your cake and eat it too, because you do not have to follow a high fat diet to get the results you're looking for if you know the hacks, if you know the tricks. And mm. it's very liberating. Mm. It because, go, go ahead. You, you go, sorry. Well, it's because if you, if you look statistically, 60% of people who follow ketogenic diet stop within a month or two, uh, either because it's in, it, it, eating that much fat just gets really hard to do. But also, as I write in the book, there's actually good evidence that animals, all animals have a carbohydrate sensing mm -hmm. a system that actually makes you look for carbohydrates. And so you're, you're working against your basic wiring when you're trying to do this. So in unlocking the keto code, what I want to give people is, is a diet they, they can live with literally and figuratively. And that's, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's really kind of fun to do. A lot of people are actually scared of the word fat because, and even some of the food groups that contribute, even if they're healthy fats, right? Yeah. They, they sort of avoid those, but yet, they don't understand that carbohydrates can contribute to excess weight that we don't need. Um, so what are some great ways? Can we become, what are some ways we can come, we become better fat burners? <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And the, and the book is all the tricks to become a fat burner and a better way to put it is a fat waster. Um, one of the easiest ways that I've talked about for years is time-restricted eating, time-controlled eating. L shorten the amount of time during the day, during the 24-hour cycle that you start eating and finish eating. And in the book, I hold people's hands to get them to basically not eat break fast until about noon and then to stop eating at about seven o'clock at night. So you have around a seven hour window of eating. Now, the reason I do this is not conjecture. There's beautiful animal studies that I show in the book make a huge difference in animals longevity, number one, in avoiding Alzheimer's, number two, and actually in reducing their cancer risk, number three. So that sounds pretty good. But there's a beautiful Italian athlete study uh, they, that I, I think is 
really sums up this information. They took Italian athletes, a cyclist, and they put them on a training table. Um, you know what that means. Uh, everybody ate the same stuff for three months. They divided them into two groups. One group ate in a 12 hour eating window. They had breakfast at 8 a.m. They had lunch at one o'clock. They had to finish dinner by eight o'clock, 12 hour eating window. Mm -hmm. The other group had the same food. Breakfast was at one o'clock in the afternoon. Lunch was at four o'clock in the afternoon. Dinner was at eight o'clock, a seven hour eating window. They looked at what happened to them. The seven hour eating window guys lost weight. The 12 hour window didn't. Same amount of food. Mm. They had the same muscular performance, but the guys in the seven hour windows dramatically lowered their insulin like growth factor one, IGF one, which is still our best blood measurement of how fast or slow we're aging. So, same food, same, you know, same everything. They just compress the eating window. Now, the reason that worked is because if we have metabolic flexibility, the ability to shift burning sugar versus fat, which we should have, but most people don't, about eight hours after we finish our last meal, we begin to make ketones. By 12 hours after our last meal, they start to ramp up. So we know that the 12 hour window guys didn't really get any benefit, but now let's extend that 12 hours another like five hours. So now we've got five hour extra hours of ketones telling our mitochondria to start popping off fuel, to start wasting fuel. And that explains, number one, why this is so effective. Now, it's one thing for me to say, okay, everybody, tomorrow we're going to start having our first meal at noon. And quite frankly, most people would fall flat on their face. Um, they get headachey, they run out of energy. But what I do is say, okay, look, let's meet in the middle. Um, let's suppose you eat breakfast at 7 o'clock every morning. Next week, let's have breakfast at 8 and we'll do that all week. On the weekends, take it off. Enjoy yourself. We'll meet again next week, and we'll have breakfast at 9. Just one more hour. We'll do that all week. We'll take the weekend off. And we'll do this one hour every week for five weeks. And guess what? By the end of five weeks, we'll be having breakfast at noon, and it'll be like nothing. You know, as well as I do, when you start an exercise program, um, you don't lift a 40 pound dumbbell and do bicep curls. Uh, when you start, uh, your arms would fall to the floor. You know, tear. But <laughs> they would tear. You'd rip your biceps. Correct. But you, you look at a, a, a 40 pounder. And you go, yeah. You know, <laughs> come on. Don't you have anything better? But you have to work your way up gradually. And it's the same way with this. This is kind of an exercise program for our mitochondria. And this is training. And if you accomplish this training, you get the benefits. So that's just one way. Uh, and the book goes into all these other tricks of uncoupling mitochondria. One of my favorite is goat and sheep milk products. Huh. How does that work? Wow. Uh, so... Most people in the ketogenic community know about the benefit of MCT oil, medium chain triglycerides. Medium chain triglycerides are unique among fats in that they're absorbed from our intestines and go directly to our liver. In the liver, they're converted directly into ketones, regardless of what else you're eating. So, and this was actually known about in childhood epilepsy. Um, eventually, there was an MCT oil based diet for childhood ep epilepsy where the kids could have a lot more carbohydrates and a lot more protein because they were always generating ketones from the MCT oil. And it's been a part of my ketogenic diet ever since I started working with patients. So, MCT oil is 
clear, it's flavorless, and you can use it to actually produce ketones. Mm -hmm. I joke, but you could have a fruit salad, which would be the antithesis of a keto diet, and have a tablespoon of MCT oil, and you would make ketones, even though you ate all those carbohydrates. Now, I don't want you to have a fruit salad, but that's another point. Um, <laughs> now, yes. it, turns out, it turns out that goat and sheep milk, 30% of the calories in goat and sheep milk are MCTs. And so oh. lo and behold, you can have like goat yogurt or sheep yogurt, or goat cheese or sheep cheese, and actually generate ketones just in the process of enjoying your goat or sheep yogurt or a piece of goat cheese. So as I write in the book, goat cheese is really the goat of cheeses, the greatest of all time. Interestingly enough, the types of medium chain triglycerides, C6, C8, C10, are named copra after goat because oh. that's where they were first discovered. So this fun is fact, any, fun fact. Go for it. Yeah, any any goat or sheep product. Wow. Yeah. Huh. And you, Does, doesn't and, have to be organic? Well, I, most goats, believe it or not, uh, will only eat uh, weeds and grass. They uh, You can't feed them grains. Wow. So if we were to look at the, the back and the ingredients list, should we watch out for anything in particular or just? Better just say goat or sheep. Um, no. <laughs> nothing else. <laughs> nothing else. <laughs> nothing. No, none of the other rubbish stuff. But right. I'm I'm curious about the the ketosis process. I mean, is it dangerous for us to be in a continual state of ketosis? Absolutely. Yeah. Number one, there's no evidence that our ancestors would have ever been in continuous ketosis because can you imagine if um, you know we haven't eaten for a week and we you know stumble we kill an antelope and we you know you and i you know ketogenic dieters we go oh gee i i, I better not eat any of that oh because you know i want to stay in ketosis of course not you know you eat you're full you know you, you really stuff yourself same way you hit a tree with berries you're you know, like, oh, gee, I really only should have one or two. I want to stay in ketosis. Of course not. You're going to cram your mouth full. So the, the evidence is continuous ketosis actually begins to produce insulin resistance and muscle wasting. And this is oh. sadly um, what happens to people who try to do ketosis 24-7, you know, seven days a week. Um, 365 days a year. And it's because, uh, as I go into the book, in mitochondria, if you're in continuous ketosis, figure that the end is near because what the heck are all these ketones always being here? You must be starving to death. And they're going to protect themselves at all costs. And there's really cool evidence that the mitochondria make the muscles resistant to insulin so that the muscles don't steal any of the food. And they actually make all the proteins for themselves to keep themselves alive and stop making proteins for building muscle. So this is, it's a long-term problem that there is no, you know, historical evidence, physiologic evidence that continuous ketosis is good for us. Mm. Yeah. My mom's always warning me. She's like, don't go into ketosis because of your kidneys won't be good for them. And it's, same for your, same for your muscles, <laughs> but I'm not always in ketosis. Like, no. And, it, and in fact, most, most people uh, who think they're continuously in ketosis when, when we look at them in our clinic there, they're not. In fact, a huge number of ketogenic dieters uh, never actually get into proper ketosis um, huh. because of the foods they're eating. Right. Okay. So speaking about the kinds of foods that we should be eating on in the ketogenic diet, I know you're a big advocate for certain food groups and ones that you shouldn't touch, albeit lectins being one of them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you're famous for that. 
Um, so what are some of the, the oils more or less or, or the fats that we should be consuming? Uh, I've, I noticed in the book that you mentioned canola oil, but it has to be organic. Correct. Why, why is that? Turns out that almost all canola oil in the United States is uh, sprayed or canola seeds uh, are sprayed with Roundup. And so that it, canola had been banned from my previous books because of that. But there's now some organic canola producers. Now, yeah. canola oil has uh, a, a big con a constituent of uh, canola oil is alpha linolenic acid, better known as ALA. Alpha linolenic acid is a short chain omega-3 fat. Uh, the other short chain omega-6 fat is linole linoleic acid. And I'm sorry, the terms are really close. <laughs> um, so there's some really cool studies showing that ALA uncouples mitochondria, allow mitochondria to let off steam. And there's a very excuse me, famous study in heart disease called the Leon heart diet, lion heart diet. And they took people who had known heart disease, they had heart attacks, and they randomized them to two diets. One, a Mediterranean diet where they had to have a, a butter spread that was made out of alpha linoleic, uh, linolenic acid, ALA. The other group followed the American Heart Association low fat diet. The study was supposed to go five years. They stopped the study after three years because the ALA group had vastly superior results. And they felt it was unethical to continue the study because it was so different. When the researchers uh, finally broke down everything possible in the two diets that would have contributed to this, the one factor that they found made a difference was the amount of ALA in their blood. I mean, the one factor uh, that made all the difference. Oh, thanks. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, that's a that's a really interesting, and you can get it in uh, ground flax seeds, you can get it in uh, flaxseed oil, another great source for it. So that's one thing. The other thing that I think is important that the Framingham Heart Study, which is the world's longest heart study began back in the 1940s. It's now, I think, in the third generation of, of families. They found that there's really only four fats that make a difference in heart health and longevity. One of them is DHA, the uh, long chain omega-3 fat in fish oil. Uh, another one, which surprises me, well, maybe not, is uh, contained in macadamia nut oil, omega-7. And then there's some fats that are only contained primarily in dairy, of all things. And it, the more you have of these fats, including what's called a very long chain fat, uh, the better your health, the longer you live. So, and those were the, those are the keys to health. So, uh, get yourself some macadamia nuts, get yourself some macadamia nut oil and uh, have some fish oil and get yourself some ALA. Yeah. Well, I, for one, am a big proponent on macadamia nuts and mac macadamia oil. We have it at home all the time. Yeah. So, great stuff. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So you're getting a really cool uh, uncoupling oil, uh, omega-7, and it's a really cool stuff. Usually when mom just says, look, eat this, it's good for you, it's healthy, I just follow along with it. Like I trust her judgment because more than likely she's researched it more than I have, but hearing you talk about it makes a lot more sense for me <laughs> as well. So um, so mom's right on this one. Yeah, she is. <laughs> Mom, moms are usually right. Um, you know, just as an aside with, with DHA, DHA, the amount of DHA in your brain uh, correlates with the size of your brain and the size of your memory centers, the hippocampus. So mom was right when she said fish is brain food. Yeah. She didn't know why she was right, but she knew this intrinsically. Fascinating stuff. And how much fat is too much fat? Like how much should we be eating on a daily basis? 
So that's a great question. There's actually two studies, long-term human studies, uh, looking at humans who consume 10 tablespoons of olive oil a day. Mm. That's actually a liter of olive oil per week. And uh, there, uh, the Predimed study out of Spain, there's two blue zones that consume a liter of olive oil per week. But interestingly enough, if weight loss is your objective, and for many people reading this book, it is, there's studies comparing weight loss in humans on an MCT oil-based diet versus an olive oil-based diet. And two different studies showed that same calories, same amount of calories, the people who got the MCT oil in their diet lost three to four kilograms more than the olive oil uh, diet. So uh, again, why? Because the MCTs are converted into ketones and the ketones tell your mitochondria to do a caloric bypass, waste calories. We want our mitochondria to become Ferraris in more ways than one. So the MCT, does that have like other health benefits the same as olive oils? No. So olive oil's big health benefit is actually in the polyphenols it contains. And that's a big part of the book that polyphenols in and of themselves are superb mitochondrial uncouplers. Uh, but MCT you know, makes ketones every time you use it. Yeah. So, you know, have yourself a, a piece of sheep cheese or goat cheese and uncouple your mitochondria. Well, what, what a nice thing. Amazing. I was the nice speaking. thing about, oh, go ahead. You go, sorry. <laughs> well, the great thing about this book is you do not have to eat an unpalatable, you know, 80% fat diet and avoid carbohydrates like the plague to actually achieve the benefits of a ketogenic diet, as long as you know these various hacks. And that's what's so exciting. It's very exciting, I think. And because yeah. I've been following keto for a long time, I think ever since I found out about your plant paradox book and uh, trying to fix my gut, I found that fats work a lot better for my system, the kind of fat that I was eating. In fact, like it helps me sort of re fix my IBS and my SIBO, which was hugely beneficial and helpful for me. So for those people that um, I guess that are looking for a particular diet of such, how does the ketogenic diet compare to other diets? And is it the best diet out there? Well, I think you've got to do understand why you're doing a ketogenic diet and I hope with this book, people will realize that you do not have to have a high fat diet to get the benefits of a ketogenic diet. In fact, uh, some of my uh, mainstream ketogenic dieters, when we look at their blood work, uh, they feel great. But when we look at their blood work, we see pretty impressive inflammation on the inside of their blood vessels. We see that Strangely enough, their blood vessels are very stiff. They don't get flexibility. Mm -hmm. And when we kind of take them from that high fat diet and change them over to my ketogenic diet, and you may have noticed in the plant paradox, my ketogenic diet has actually lots of carbohydrates that are, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that are fair. And people, as I talk about in the book, people follow that diet and the weight kind of falls off of them. And sometimes to the point that, holy cow, you know, I got to stop. Uh, you know, how do I gain some weight? And it's because of what you're eating in this program just automatically turns your mitochondria into Ferraris mm -hmm. and just literally, you know, the fuel heads out the tailpipe, if you like. Comparing your plan paradox book diet to this diet, has it changed a great deal? Because I'm still yet to finish the Keto Code book. So the Keto Code book uh, literally explains why the ketogenic version of my diet has such a good effect. And it's like, okay, here's the stuff I didn't know when I designed, you know, chapter 10 of the ketogenic intensive care program. 
here's how here's what's really happening at the you know at the cellular level and here now let's take this information and take it a step farther let's do time restricted eating or intermittent fasting let's add things like you know goat cheese and sheep cheese or goat yogurt or sheep yogurt safely into our diet let's enjoy them um so it, it actually offers even more variety than one would have thought mm. would i be able to ask you a few more questions is that okay uh yeah i've got a hard out uh, in a few minutes so no worries two final questions for you so what are some no-go foods no-go foods on the ketogenic diet that most people would actually include in a ketogenic diet just so people are aware so as i i, talk, I have a whole chapter on good fats and bad fats and most of the fats in a ketogenic diet, like bacon, for instance, um, you know, just as an example, there's a beautiful paper that shows the effect of bacon on a ketogenic diet is actually horrible in terms of the function of your cells versus, for instance, olive oil or MCT oil. So it's simple things like this. I mean, a pound of cream cheese is not really going to thwart your efforts long term. And so I see people, you know, with a pound of cream cheese with a with a side of bacon and with cheddar cheese, you know, chaser. And really, as the book shows, there's really good reasons why this is not a get, great idea long term for you. Mm. Yeah. Where can people get a copy of this book and learn more about your incredible work, Dr. Gunji? Yeah. And the real book is a hardcover. That's just a preprint. Uh, you can get it at wherever you get books, uh, amazon.com, barnesandnoble.com. Please visit your local bookseller. As you know, I have multiple New York Times bestsellers. So almost all bookstores have my books and they'll they'll be ordering this one because it's it'll be a bestseller. And so wherever you, wherever you can get them, get them. I have no doubt that this book will become a bestseller, but Dr. Gundry, thank you so much for unlocking the Keto Code for us today. Really do appreciate, once again, your time and speaking with you on the Storybox podcast. Well, and thank you for allowing me to tell my story on your box. <laughs> <laughs>